Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire supported by Glenn David Books. My guest today is India's former Vice President Hamid Ansari. Tomorrow his book is launched, it's his autobiography and here it is, it's called By Many a Happy Accident. The launch is tomorrow evening at 6 o'clock but today Mr. Ansari is my guest and let me tell you what makes this book particularly special is the candor and sometimes even the outspoken manner in which Mr. Ansari has addressed the state of the country today. And that is the subject I'm going to raise with him this evening. Mr. Ansari, let's start with the state of the country today. Your book has many telling comments about it and I want to take you through several of them one by one. To begin with, you write that the 2019 general election represents the success of populism assisted by authoritarianism, nationalism and majoritarianism. Do you believe that 2019 rather than the earlier election of 2014 was the real turning point? There is a progression in the whole process of implementing a certain agenda. 2014, it was uh, somewhat subdued. Um, all you have to do is something that I didn't do then and uh, I've since gone back and read them many a time. The election manifesto of 2014 and the election manifesto of 2019. And they tell their own story. And what is the story they tell? Well, the story is that the theme of populism and majoritarianism and many other adjectives that can be added has been played on the front foot in a very aggressive manner. After 2019? Yes, yes, absolutely. We have seen instances of it uh, in uh, government legislation and in certain government practices, not necessarily in Delhi, elsewhere in the country. So the agenda which was in a sense incipient in 2014 came into full bloom in 2019? Absolutely. Which is why 2019 is the real turning point? Oh yes, no question about it. I, everybody, friend and foe, will acknowledge that. That 2019 is, is the turning, turning point for India. Absolutely. In that context then, let's talk first about the sort of nationalism that today holds sway in our country. You write, quoting in fact from your own National Law School lecture of August 2017, you write in your book, a version of nationalism that places cultural commitments at its core and promotes intolerance and arrogant patriotism has tended to intrude and take over the political and cultural landscape. Our manifestation of it is an increasingly fragile national ego that threatens to rule out any dissent, however innocent. Hyper-nationalism and the closing of the mind is also a manifestation of insecurity about one's place in the world. This nationalism is very different to the nationalism of our founding fathers and the nationalism that gave us our independence. Precisely. You see, nationalism of our founding fathers is spelt out loud and clear in the pronouncements of national leaders, in the debates on the, of the Constituent Assembly and in the text of the Constitution itself. So there is no ambiguity about the nationalism of the Indian national movement. But this has gone in a different direction. This is a marked change, a sea change. Oh, absolutely. No question about it. And I don't think anybody would uh, uh, controvert that. Even, fact, it's, is... even its proponents will not controvert it because they say that this is the right direction in which it should go. In fact, this is an altogether different nationalism to the nationalism India gave itself in 47. You see, this is what I said somewhere in a short speech. Uh, uh, I said patriotism is the right word. Aggressive nationalism coupled with uh, strident religiosity takes you in a different direction altogether. As far as this country and this uh, society is concerned, because this there are certain ground realities. You know, it's a plural society. It is not something imposed on it. And all of that has been put to one side by this cultural nationalism, yes. which identifies itself with the primacy of a particular religion. Precisely. That religion is Hinduism. 
Well, I'm not talking of what religion it is. The point is, it is a plural society, 20%, which means one out of uh, every five, you know, is, belongs to a different religion or faith. Now, right or wrong, uh, but 20%, out of which 14 point some percent happen to be the biggest religious minority, which is the Muslims. And those are people, that 20%, that one out of five every Indian, who is effectively ignored by this cultural nationalism. Certainly subdued. Subdued. Yes. You call this cultural nationalism. That's the phrase you use in the quotation I read. And you also say it's making India intolerant, arrogant, insecure. Can you explain that a bit? Well, you see it in the pronouncements, you see it in the policies, and you see it in the way governance is conducted in different parts of the country, particularly where a particular party is the dominant party. So the behavior of the ruling party, we're deliberately not naming it, but the audience will know who we're talking about. The behavior of the ruling party is making it arrogant, intolerant, it's making the country insecure. It is projection of a certain temperament. What is that temperament? Well, you see it in uh, practice. So, I mean, the, the Indians are used to living in a certain way. I mean, you go through the length and breadth of India, uh, from uh, big cities to small villages. How do people live and work? And this cultural nationalism is changing the way Indians live the way Indians view themselves, the way Indians relate with each other. It's changing us almost completely. Oh, absolutely. If you are asked not to buy from Hawker X, but to buy from Hawker Y, this is not the way people buy their daily necessities. The Hawker is the Hawker. You so this cultural nationalism is fracturing the relationships that kept India homogenous. It's also, as a result, dividing us people to people. It will have that effect. Whether it has happened right now or not could be a matter of detailed investigation. But it's only a matter of time. It will have to be like that. You see, already something had started many years ago. Uh, renting of houses. I'm talking of middle class. Renting of houses. Uh, questions were asked, uh, are you this or that? You're not. Some years back, uh, before I became vice president, Somebody I had known many years ago and who lives in Delhi and who's a professional rang me up and said, you know, there's an exclusive uh, locality coming up in uh, Noida, or the expanded Noida. Uh, all people of a certain faith, will you please participate in it? So I said, I have no idea of firstly of acquiring uh, uh, another piece of property or of living in a certain atmosphere. Where I live is a very comfortable atmosphere. Another word for an exclusive property for people of a particular faith is a ghetto. Well, yes, a ghetto, aggressive ghetto or less aggressive ghetto, dominant ghetto or, I mean, what has happened? For there are building societies in Bombay where Muslims are not welcome, not allowed, not allowed to own, not allowed to rent. This is known for a long time. Even someone like Shabana Azmi once said to me in an interview, if I, with my background, my lifestyle, am not allowed to live in a particular part of Bombay, think of what it means for the rest of India's Muslims and minorities. Well, best evidence of it is what happened uh, post-2002 uh, to uh, people in a city like uh, Ahmedabad. There are localities in Ahmedabad that have become Muslim-only ghettos. No one else lives there. Nobody goes there. And often civic communities are, are not, not available. There. Precisely. And this is done deliberately by the government of the day. Why else would municipality, concerned municipality, resort to this kind of selective uh, behavior? You write that this process, this whole process of pursuing cultural nationalism and entrenching it into the country has affected our commitment to the rule of law and it's affected the efficacy of our institutions. I'm going to quote you. You say, our commitment to the rule of law seems to be under serious threat arising out of the noticeable decline 
in the efficacy of institutions of state. And then you add, we have lapsed into arbitrary decision making and even mob rule. I wrote all this uh, more than a year back, but nothing that has happened since then in the past 11 months or so has persuaded me to change any bird of it. In fact, most of it has been underlined, highlighted. Oh yes, it's getting worse. You see the reports that come from state A and state B, not to go any further. But what will shake people? Not because it's untrue, but because someone who's been vice president for 10 years is saying it, that we've lapsed into mob rule in places. In places it has happened. I'm, I don't have to say it, or I didn't have to say it from my, in the high chair I was occupying. But it's a fact of life. It is to be seen in the daily coverage of newspapers, sometimes even of television channels. This is the beef lynchings, the love jihads, the Rome, anti-Romeo squads. You see, we resort to strange kind of sophistry. We are perhaps the biggest or the second largest uh, meat exporter in the world. And uh, I have seen Indian exports in uh, the supermarkets of uh, uh, the Persian Gulf countries. They bear a certain label. Now those labels are put here by the exporter. So how is he allowed to export that kind of thing? And who owns these big export houses? So, I mean, yes, you can send a lot of it in any shape or form to Vietnam for onward uh, uh, movement to China. They'll eat everything. They have uh, different uh, food let, habits. Let me be explicit about what you're hinting at very delicately. You're talking about the way in which one particular state government, Yogi Adityanath in UP, has come down really hard, if not viciously, on meat exporters, the vast majority of whom, the preponderant majority of whom are Muslims. And this was a burgeoning trade which was growing and increasing and earning valuable export money for India. And it is grinding to a halt because the export is buffalo meat. I don't know what uh, the data now is. I haven't looked at it for many, many months. But uh, I think it is being marketed in a very, uh, shall I say, sophisticated manner. This is an example of mob rule. The mob, let's be honest, is of one faith. The people it's attacking or lynching, whether it's love jihad, whether it's beef lynching, whether it's anti-Romeo squads, are people of another faith. You see, the question is, uh, in this day and age, even in India, how do you prevent a young person of this sex or that sex from exercising his or her right to choose with whoever she wishes to befriend or spend her, his or her his life with. How do you prevent a Hindu girl falling in love with a Muslim boy? She has a right to if she wants to. It's not a crime. Under the law, it's not a crime. But laws are being made which will make you... You see, uh, let's admit one thing. This particular orientation started many, many years back. I came across it uh, when I was in the Minorities Commission. It started in Odisha, it started in Gujarat, you know. The orientation being the ability, capacity the, and desire of one community to attack another because of the fact that different you know, in religion. Also specifically to be uh, this control on conversions. Now people do not know that uh, when Constituent Assembly was debating Article 25-26, uh, and they said freedom of religion, etc., 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 the representatives, a minuscule number of a certain community said, preaching is part of our faith. It is part of the Christian faith. It's acknowledged as such. And Article 25 was designed to guarantee it. Exactly. It's just that the Supreme Court subsequently has interpreted the word propagate to not include convert. But that's a contentious interpretation, which could have been, but hasn't been disputed. But it could have been. Well, it is drilled into us, you and me, not to comment on these 
judiciary and particularly superior. I'll come to the judiciary in a moment's time because there's a very telling comment in your book. But first I want to pick up what you in your book appear to me to identify as two outcomes of the cultural nationalism that is being imposed on us. The first, and I'm quoting you again, is a subversion of core values and you say it is now underway. This means clearly that our commitment to the principles and values of our constitution is weakening and diminishing. To me, the gist of the constitution is in the preamble. And what are the principal expressions there? liberty, etc., etc., justice and fraternity. Now, translate that in any language into what it implies. Justice is what? It is the principal ingredient of any society. And you're saying, increasingly, we are failing to live up to our commitment to justice and fraternity. Oh, absolutely. Because if you induce the public to um, regard the other as the other, then where is the sense of fraternity? It's and, not big. Bill. And if there's no fraternity, there's no justice. Yes. So cultural nationalism is ensuring that the fraternity that was part of the character of our country is now diminishing, maybe it's even stopped. And similarly, justice for our minorities is undermined. I would... In fact, one of the... Dare to suggest that, and I wrote all this more than a year back. If anything, developments since then have reinforced my argument, not subtracted from it. In fact, one of the consequences of our core values being subverted, and that's a very important word you've used, subverted, is that we have changed the way we view and regard secularism. I'm going to quote from your book again. The term secularism itself has almost disappeared from the government's official vocabulary. In its place, you say, the political ideological effort now is to superimpose the primacy of a religious majority. This is a particularly sharp and marked change because the Supreme Court itself has identified secularism as part of the basic structure of our constitution. Bumai judgment stands. And yet, very early after Bumai judgment, certain interpretations by very eminent uh, judges tended to take it in a different direction. And there were at least two occasions in my tenure as Vice President of India, uh, in the presence of Chief Justices of India, then I said, a certain judgment needs a review. Will you explain which judgment this is? This is that one faith is a way of life. And my question is... Justice Varma's judgment of the 90s. My question was, which faith is not a way of life? Isn't Judaism a way of life? Islam a way of Absolutely. life? Absolutely. You're going back into a historical event that happened almost 20, 23, 24, 25 years ago. Let me update us. The cultural nationalism, and I go back to that quotation from your book that I read out a moment ago, that cultural nationalism in subverting our core values is undermining something that is part of the basic structure of our constitution. It's undermining secularism. Absolutely. Absolutely. There are no two views about it. And you don't have to go very far. I mean, the huge tomes have been written about secularism by very competent people, eminent scholars within the country, outside the country. All I say is, go to the Bumai judgment. But there's something that follows from this that is perhaps even more important. It's not just that a basic structure of our constitution is being undermined when secularism is being diminished. But something else follows. India, a secular country is increasingly becoming a Hindu country. I can't make that judgment because I need a lot more evidence. Uh, but it's going down that path. It's a certain direction. There's a derailment taking place. There can't be two views about it. Secularism is being derailed and we're being pushed in the direction of becoming a Hindu country. I won't use that term yet. But they're certainly being derailed. That part I subscribe to. There's a second outcome or consequence of cultural nationalism 
that you mention in your book. And again, I'm going to quote you. The fault lines in our society are visible. Cultural nationalism is making India more fragile. It's bound to be. If one in every five, and the proportions vary from place to place, is different, then this is what will happen. In other words, not just is the homogeneity, the fraternity that kept different people, different faiths, different castes, different ethnicities together, now we're fostering and perhaps encouraging division and difference. Not only that, but to uphold, abandoning certain practices. Look, it is... What, what sort of practices? Well, you and I grew up in an atmosphere in which everybody participated in everybody else's... Unconscious practices. of our religion. Yes, it is unconscious. You participated in Holi, Diwali, Eid, Bakrid, innumerable other such festivals. That's no longer the case. That is diminishing. Eid is for Muslims, Diwali for Hindus. Yes. And very few Hindus today have Muslim friends in the way they did 20, 30 years ago. Well, each one has, has a memory of it. Each one of us has a memory. But there's a I, new generation of Hindus and Muslims who don't have memories of being friends with people of the other religion. Possibly. But I can't speak for the younger generation this because is, I don't know enough about this it. This is where cultural nationalism makes India more fragile. That is a conclusion which cannot be contested. Invisible walls are being erected between religions, yes, separating people. Yes, sir. That's my view. I may, yes. I may be wrong. There may be other views. But the, what I have witnessed while I was writing the book and anything that has happened since has only reinforced it. And this endangers India. The India we knew. The India we knew. Yes. Yes. It creates a new India, but Maybe. it endangers the old India. Somebody can say the new India is a better India, but I mean, that's a point of view. Let's at this point come to something you've hinted at a couple of times, the judiciary. In your book, you express concern about the way the superior judiciary is behaving. Again, I'm going to quote you. The approach of the superior judiciary does little credit to an iconic institution and damages public confidence. Are you worried that it's compromising its independence by the extent and frequency to which it leans in favor of the government on critical issues? No, I wouldn't make that judgment because I don't know enough. But, and I'm not the uh, one to say it, there was an attorney general of India um, around 2004-2005 whom I have I, uh, mentioned somewhere when he had said that there is a weakening of institutions and that includes the judiciary. And you believe that to be true? Oh, yes. I mean, a very simple thing. The top of the list are the legislatures. Let me, let me, let me give you examples of how the judiciary has lent in favor of the government simply by refusing to act. It's refusal to take up constitutional issues to do with the change of the character of Jammu and Kashmir. It's refused to take up constitutional questions to do with the Citizenship Amendment Act. It frequently, if not the majority of the time, refuses to take up habeas corpus cases to do with the rights of and the liberties of people who are under detention. Precisely. All of that favors the government. Isn't that instances where it's compromising its independence because it's so visibly on the side of the authorities? You see, whether it favors X or Y is a secondary issue. Is this an essential function or is it not? It's letting itself down. I mean, precisely. If you say habeas corpus, what does habeas corpus mean? There are any number of eminent jurists who will tell you what it means. In other words, the judiciary is there to ensure justice to every Indian. As and it's per failing, law. As, uh, as but it's failing to do so. This is a, a widespread suspicion about which eminent judges, former judges, and eminent men of law have written quite frequently, most recently also, many cases. This is what you mean when you say that our commitment to the rule of law is not what it used to be. It's being undermined, it's being diminished, it's weakening. That's a fact of life and I don't have to 
rely on my judgment. I rely on judgment of very eminent uh, jurists. Let me put it like this. You've spent a lot of time thinking deeply about the state of the country. Yeah. You've been very candid in your expression. You've been at times very outspoken. And I've said that in the interview. And a whole year has passed since the book was written. Is this process irreversible? Have we gone so far down the road that rolling back will be difficult? I won't draw that conclusion. I'm not a pessimist. I remain optimistic because our society has a great capacity for rejuvenation. But do you need a different set of authorities ruling the country to move away from cultural nationalism and back to the civic nationalism of the 40s, 50s, 60s? How can I make a judgment about the judgment of the electorate? In other words, every electorate when it turn comes makes a judgment and it is its right. In other words, the electorate has the capacity, not just the power, but the capacity to change things if it does so. Oh. It has happened again and again in Indian electoral record. History doesn't always repeat itself, but it may. It may. I mean, history has a way of going in different directions. But the answer then to my question, is this process reversible or has it gone so far down the road it can't be rolled back, depends entirely on the Indian electorate. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Our people can change things if they want, but equally, if enough of them are convinced or beguiled by the cultural nationalism that's now becoming the dominant mood of the country, then they may never act and we may remain like this forever. That's it will still be their judgment, right or wrong. If, if, if it all depends upon how the people vote, if it all depends upon the electorate, that gives a huge advantage to the 80% who come from one faith. And it creates a particular poignant problem for the minorities who are 20%. And let me ask you, what does this mean? This no, it prevailing would, situation? It would be wrong to typecast 80% or 20% or 10% in a particular manner. I think they have the capacity to think and make judgments. Let me put this to you. What is the prevailing cultural nationalism and all the bits of it that we've talked and analyzed mean for India's minorities and in particular for India's Muslims who are 15% of the population? How do they view what I would call the Hinduization of our discourse? This is not, I wouldn't, last part I wouldn't uh, necessarily agree. But which as, is the last as, part? Which is Hinduization. Okay. But a feeling of insecurity, which I said in the Bangalore speech and on innumerable other occasions, a feeling of insecurity in minorities, not only Muslims, Christians have had the same problem, much smaller in number, but the same kind of problems. Various other minorities have had the same problem. Minorities feel insecure. Yes, that the dispensation of fairness, the word fairness is very important. That dispensation of fairness is not assured to them. Yes, yes. Why else would they feel insecure? In other why, words, why else would a um, simple shopkeeper somewhere in Old Delhi come and ask me, how may kya karu? Kaun sa kagaz jama karu? In other words, they don't believe, minorities don't believe they'll be treated fairly and properly. Could be. Could be. Are they Not necessarily has happened, no. But it could be. Could be. Are minorities beginning to feel, and let me be blunt, are Muslims beginning to feel that they've become or are becoming second class citizens in their own country? There's been enough articulation of that, particularly since last year's protests uh, at Shaheen Bagh and subsequently on innumerable other occasions. You just have to see the social media. Um, Muslims feel they're being treated as second class citizens. Could be. Could be. Do they feel that they are unwanted in their own country? Those, those are conclusions. Individuals. But they feel them. insecure. And they feel that treated feeling as of insecurity. What, how does it manifest it, itself? Is a very complex thing. And they don't feel they'll be treated fairly and properly by the government. Of sometimes. And sometimes. They, and they're beginning to feel second class in their own country. Sometimes. Let me ask you this: 
How do you view the Citizenship Amendment Act? Do you believe that the exclusion of Muslims from its provisions is justified on the grounds the government claims that allegedly they are not persecuted in Afghanistan, Pakistan and Bangladesh? Or does this exclusion undermine India's secularism and vitiate our constitutional commitment to equality? Look, it's a much uh, wider debate. I won't go into it. But um, the point is, it was always within the powers of the government to give a persecuted person in another country refuge. It was always there. You didn't need the CA. You didn't need it. You, it is always there and it has been done over time in neighboring uh, districts of uh, different states. But now if you consciously choose to create a CAA, which as you pointed out we didn't need to do, but if you've chosen to create one, is it justified to explicitly leave out Muslims from its provision? I don't know what implications there are legal and practical, but it is making people insecure. That's all I can fairly say. And it also makes people feel that they don't have the same rights and privileges as others. It could lead to that. This was at the very heart of the Shaheen Bagh and other protests just over a year ago. Well, the point is, if you look at the Shaheen Bagh, and now it is the subject of a, a good deal of literature, where did out of nowhere the same uh, Muslim women, you know, backward, parda clad, there's that and all the rest, develop this courage? It certainly is something that shook the government and its supporters completely by surprise. I think it shook everybody by surprise. It shook you and me by surprise. One more question before I ask you about Muslim women that stood up in Shaheen Park. How do you view the fact that increasingly, almost with the rapidity and a frequency that's becoming alarming, Muslims are becoming the main targets of beef lynching, love jihad, and often charged with sedition. And in addition to all of this, you increasingly find ruling parties, MPs, MLAs, even sometimes ministers, criticizing Muslims because they are Muslims, even claiming that they are anti-national. No, no, I won't go into that debate because that would be particularizing certain incidents. That's a much wider debate. It's an open society. It is being discussed in parliament, outside parliament. Uh, we'll leave it at that. But do you my, think my book is not focused only on the feeling of insecurity of Muslims. It's a much wider... Let me then come back to the thought you raised about the Muslim women of Shaheen Bagh, their courage, their determination. And there's a comment in your book that brings this to my mind. You say, the failure of the Muslim community to engage with the wider community in sufficient measure. What's your message to the Muslim community? The same. Don't put yourself in little cocoons. You live... It's a unique situation in the world. And I've said this again and again, uh, that Indian experience of diversity should be a model for the world. In other words, don't think of yourself as separate. Don't accept being pushed into a ghetto. You have to also push back. Not only that, you just have to feel normal. If I have a neighbor who's different, then he's... So what? He's still a neighbor. Is it easy to feel normal when others around you are determined to make you feel different? Well, at a certain point, it clicks. And it reinforces a certain prejudice that may have been incipient, but then if you keep repeating it, it becomes a fact of life. My last question, Mr. Ansari, you've written, as I've said repeatedly, very candidly, at times very outspokenly, and there's no hint of agreeing with the mood of cultural nationalism that is dominating the country. You are strongly opposed to it, you're deeply critical of it. Are you worried that the authorities who rule the country will be sharply critical of you? That they will pounce on you? Look, you can... I've played cricket in my younger days. So, bouncers are part of the game. Even beamers are part of the game, though outlawed. 
In other words, you're ready for whatever attack you face from the authorities of the day. I don't face anything. I've ended my book uh, in a Persian, well-known Persian couplet that I have retrieved into being an ascetic, a darwish to be the precise term. But just before that prophetic couplet, you also have a couple of sentences on the last page where you talk about the mistake of trying to recreate history in the image of just one religion. I have quoted a very eminent scholar. But that mistake is being done by the authorities that rule us today. They don't view it as a mistake. They view it as a correction of what they call the earlier mistake in history. This is why I ask, you're fighting against that. Are you worried how they will respond to you? History is full of instances of people trying to recreate history. You don't recreate. History is a fact of life. Recreate the future. Recreate the, create the present. In other words, you're also saying this will pass. Oh, yes. Oh, Grit yes. your teeth while it's there, but it will pass. Of course it will pass. Strident nationalism may you be see, the dominant is... theme of today, but it cannot continue forever. Has it worked anywhere in the world? Tell you me. really are an optimist when you say this will pass. Of course it will pass. It is bound to be the compulsions, the imperatives of the society will take it in that direction. I hope you're right, Mr. Ansari. You're showing a lot of faith in the Indian people, the Indian electorate and the strength of Indian society. I hope you're right. Because at the moment, cultural nationalism is strengthening its grip on us. Let's hope you're right when you say it will pass. Seasons change. Yes, seasons change. And tomorrow is always another day. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much for this interview. Thank you. Thank you. Mm.